Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for another edition of Advocate with Albert Apkirian. We have with us today uh, Emil uh, from Artsakh, uh, and we're going to do an interview today, and we're going to get a little bit of background from him and then get some more updated information as much as he can give to us uh, in reference to what's going on in the region and, uh, and the uh, aggression by the Azerbaijanis and the war in Artsakh. Emil, welcome. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing there and uh, what's going on and your, a little bit about your background. Um, just to confirm, I'm not currently there at the moment. Okay. Uh, what, do you, what is your background? Tell me a little bit about your background. So I'm a former British Royal Marine Commando. I served 12 years in the British military. Um, served several tours of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq. And since leaving the military, I've, I've gone into combat journalism. So I've, I'm a documentary filmmaker and a journalist, and I've covered conflicts um, Again, Islamic State in Syria, Iraq, and I've been over into parts of Iran, and also made a feature documentary also on the war in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, what is your project now? What are you working on currently? So, the the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia um, initiated in end of September. So, doing what I do is when there's a conflict and there's generally little understanding of what's going on. So there was very little media coverage of what was going on. And I think that was downly, mainly due to Corona, that every country's domestic news was busy with Corona and also the US elections. So I was very intrigued to find out, to, to see that there's a war going on and there was very little reporting. So doing what I normally do, so I generally self-fund all my projects. I decided to book myself a flight, get myself to Armenia, and then from there, try to get my way to the front line to find out at the grassroots level what exactly is going on? Um, what have you learned so far? Uh, you know, let's go back to when you first got there and then kind of work ourselves to where we are today. Yeah, so <clears throat> when I first arrived and trying to get into ARSA, it, you've got to go through the procedures, you've got to get accreditation, um, you've got to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also then speak to the press office in Goris area and then get yourself across and find out what, to see firsthand what's going on. First impression is, this is not my first war zone. It's like I say, from my experience, I've been to several war zones. However, this war is very different. And the reason why this war is very different is because the drone. And the fact is they're using rockets that launch several hundred miles away and it's landing on civilian targets. But the fact is the key one for this battle is the amount of drones that Azerbaijan are using, which have been supplied to them by Israel and Turkey. And when it comes to the arms trade, for example, with this new warfare, drones have been around for many years, but not on the scale they're being used here. With the kamikaze drone and also short drones, smaller drones that can, they've got quite a long uh, flight time and can deliver payloads by searching the battlefield, looking for targets. And we've seen that with a lot of Azerbaijan's social media platforms. They're sharing a lot of these videos online. So it was definitely a very different battle. So I went to Stepanica and I was based out there. And from there, I was going out to different areas to see what's going on. And as warfare goes, as kinetic warfare, so what I'd describe kinetic warfare would be very much like my time in Afghanistan fighting against the Taliban, where you're fighting quite regularly and it's shoot, shooting missiles and stuff like that. Um, this, it, in certain regions in the south, it's, it's more kinetic, as in soldier on soldier, but the majority of the battlefield is rockets, artillery and drones. So it's a very different form of warfare. It's not soldier to soldier, basically a fight, so to speak. Mm. Some areas, but not not everywhere. Okay, and and in reference to based on your experience, what is the biggest difficulty that you see? Uh, you know, not not going too de detailed into it, but what is the biggest difficulty that you see for Artsakh and Armenia fighters? Well, the fact is, at the moment, soldiers is the limited time that I spent with the soldiers actually on the front line is their morale's high. They. They were very happy to see a British journalist. They were happy for their photos to be taken. They were happy to be filmed. And that was obviously approved by the Ministry of um, Defence, who were happy for me to do that. And the, the guys I met, their morale was very high. As soon as we turned up, the banter was going, the jokes were going. And then quite quickly, when I was on the front line, you could hear the drones, so we took cover. Um, you could hear the shelling, the rounds going over. So it was very active still on the front line. And But the soldiers are there, they're holding the line, at the moment, for information on who's taking what bit of ground, it's quite hard to find out the actual intelligence, especially 
me being a journalist, asking questions that are quite operational security related, people get a bit concerned about I'm I, who am I going to tell, what's going on. So yeah. they're a bit wary on what information they give out on like what towns, who's advanced where. But in Stepanica, there's a lot of civilians that are living underground. The women, majority of women and children have left the city. It's generally the people that are left, the old, the vulnerable and the sick. And I only met one family with children that were there. And it, it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see the, the resilience of living underground with constant fear and seeing these people just carry on. And speaking to some of the old people that uh, they remember the time of the previous war and they've seen their sons go off to war in the previous war. And this time they've seen their grandsons going off to war. It's, it's that constant cycle of when will this end? And I've, I've got to remain objective. But the fact is that I'm with the Armenian side is I'm only going to get a certain perspective of the conflict from the Armenian side. And some people I've met, especially ones who don't live in Armenia, try to they try to make out that Armenia are victims here in this war. And from what I'm seeing, that the the feeling on the on the battlefield and in the towns is that no one feels like a victim. They feel like they're they're resilient, they're strong, they're standing and fighting for their survival. And that's something that was very different to this conflict as well. That from the Armenians I've met, it's not a war for territory. It's a war they see it as a survival of survival. And especially relating back to the first genocide in 2015, when the world was busy with the First World War, I think a lot of people feel that they're being forgot about now because COVID, US election and other things going on around the world geopolitically, that they're worried that Turkey's influence, that they might be a second genocide. Well, we, we all worry in, in diaspora uh, about that as well. Uh, how do they, uh, do, are they getting, uh, you know, equipment? Are they getting food? Are they getting humanitarian aid? Is it is it reaching to them? Do they know that the diaspora is, you know, completely behind them? Yeah, I was speaking to some people. They, if you're living out in the United States of America or UK or Europe, you, you see people seem very far detached from their their homeland, let's, let's call it for a better thing. The people on the ground know there's a support, support's there. They're seeing that with funding that's coming in through humanitarian aid, through supplies. And across the country, everywhere I went, there's a massive war effort. And clearly I'm not old enough to survive the, um, to be living during the Second World War. But I can imagine that's what it was like where people rallied together. Women, children, mother, father, grandparents rallying together, collecting the equipment, making equipment and sending it forward. Like I went to um, Yervan to a, a former school that they're making camouflage nets where women are physically tying up camouflage nets to send to the front line for the troops and other places where they're collecting sleeping bags and uniforms and just food and soap and water and, and stuff like bottles of water and stuff. And they're sending it in vehicles down towards the front line area to be distributed to the soldiers. So from my experience, I wouldn't say the Armenian forces are as well equipped as, for example, a fighting force like United Kingdom or a NATO country. But slowly, I think equipment's getting forward to the front line and it's actually reaching the soldiers on the front. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect to hear. Uh, what, do you, what do you see uh, the diaspora needing to do more than uh, what they're doing already? So that, that's a hard one. Is Because um, I'm going back to film next week, and a lot of people are saying to me, how do we donate to you? They know I'm self-funded. Please, please I mean, tell us. Me. That's very important for, for our audience to, to know how they can actually help you put together an incredible you know, uh, documentary. Mm. But so, yeah, so a lot of people were interested in what I was doing and wanted to donate. So um, a few people recommend I start to go fund me account and it's made massive amounts of money in such a short period of time. And to be honest with you, I don't need any more money for that documentary. It's more than enough for me to start get, go, getting on with it. There's been a few private sponsors have said, if you need any more money, we can, we can help you out there. So really for me, um, it's been brilliant. And the support of the, the Armenian community around the world has been massive. And... There's so many donation pages. There's so, people have been so generous. And from the groups I was seeing on the ground that were looking after displaced people, I was seeing firsthand where that money was going. And of course, there's a lot of disinformation. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of haters out there um, that would turn around and go, well, people stealing that money from charity. From what I saw, 
all money was going direct without a middleman straight to the end user. Now, there's certain people out there and organisations that are going around visiting soldiers, parents and wives and children when the soldiers died, giving them money and saying, this is from diaspora around the world supporting you. Um, and of course, you mean, when you've lost your, your son or your husband, having a few thousand dollars shoved in a brown eight envelope, it's probably the last thing you really want. But long term, that will help these people. So definitely across the board, Armenian community is helping people actually physically on the ground. Okay, uh, Emil, uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I just wanted to also say that, um, you know, you have my support, you have our support. And please, please, we I encourage you to, uh, to uh, do either a GoFund page or some other page where people mm. could come in and help you even make a bigger bang than you were you were thinking about doing. So yeah. if you have something like that, please share that with me so I can share it with my uh, viewers and we can move from there. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, I think overall, it's, the biggest problem I think in this conflict is there's more Armenians living out of Armenia than actually in. And yeah. because of that, and the lack of information that's coming out of the, the country, there's so many people worried. There's people that, that are reading stories, that are fake news, disinformation, and they're sharing it. And I, I would stress to anyone is check what you're sharing. The information that you're sharing, make sure you fact check it. Get a picture, go on Google reverse, make sure it's a real picture. Because I think some people who've got good intentions are just spreading misinformation. And I think that has a knock on effect to actually the end result of the guys on the, on the front line as such. But if they start hearing about all this propaganda and I think people just need to relax a bit, try to get find out people that are out there reporting firsthand and work off what they're saying. Because at the moment, there's so it's, it's a war. And both sides are using propaganda because they need to, because it's tactically, um, strategically, they will do it to deceive the enemy as such. And also it's because they need to control the information that's coming out. So I just, I just I would say to people that are worried at home is don't try to get, don't get too stressed and just try to see from social media what's going on. But you've got to filter through all the white noise that's out there. There's no question about it. Oh, thank you. Please stay safe. Uh, keep the keep up the good work and and uh, we will hopefully connect again in, in maybe a week or so yeah. and come over a few other things. Yeah, and I'll just like to say um, next week um, I'll be flying back out again and I'm going to start filming next week. So uh, it's really successful my Instagram stories and and I think what we, I was saying there is people don't know what's going on. People around the world don't physically see. So I think that's why my work's become so successful amongst the Armenian community is because it's grassroots. I've tried to put a bit of sarcasm, a bit of humour in there, even though it's a dark place war, but me serving many years in the military is, I've seen some extremely hilarious and uh, fun times in dark times. And even going to the front line, the first thing the soldiers are doing are the, the cracking jokes, there's banter going on. So I thought I want that to come across from my first hand experience, but so I'll be out there again next week and I'll be doing Instagram stories so people can follow me, Emil Geeson on Instagram, where I'm going to try to keep you updated with what's going on. Of course, it's hard to get content that's fresh all day, every day, um, but I'll do my best to give you um, an insight into what's going on. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, I really give everyone a hug, tell them that we're all with them, that we are thinking about them, and please stay safe and, and, and uh, uh, be good. Thank you very much. All right, take care now. Cheers. In the morning, we were informed about an attack that happened the night before. So we head down there to see what happened. And this was the position that came under attack yesterday by two rockets from Azerbaijan. Militarily, there's nothing here other than the fact is troops use it as a transit route to the front line. Uh, one civilian was killed. As I arrive, the cousin of the man who was killed has moved the vehicle and is covering it up with his son. The car was parked on the main road with the man inside as it was struck from the top. He died instantly. The cousin of the man who was killed said two bombs landed, one to the side and one through the roof, and that he was a 50-year-old civilian. He then goes on to say, what can you do? They are barbarians. 
It's evident to see the cousin is still in shock from what's happened. These men are just civilians and there was no reason for them to be attacked. Just as we finish speaking with the cousin, another guy comes out across the road to tell us that a bomb had landed last night at midnight. He describes the missile used as a smirch missile, which have been used by Azerbaijan. Some of them in this region haven't exploded like this one. Well, there's nothing here in the village and the guy is saying it struck about midnight and there's no strategic interest here there's no military here and it's a, it's a smirch weapon rocket launchers that are they're not used to target they're just used on a trajectory fire and it off it goes at a certain range it will land and this is what they're using against civilians and really under international law is a war crime saying they're 500 meters away and he's just showing me he's going to let me have a look but you hear the, the artillery going over and these guys are really just holding the fence here. Let's have a look, Chuck. Thank you. Look right next to the tires over there. Tires. Oh yeah, seen yet. Oh yeah. Now I see it. Ah, Yeah, you can see there how close it is. You can actually see the positions. And in 2020, with what's going on in the world with COVID, and you were soldiers here that are eyeballing each other, 500 meters across the map. 